Different by design. Studebaker is. Studebaker. Well, hello, everybody. I recognize a few of you. It is good. I like being in rooms like this. Um, yeah, so my name is Aaron. I am the author of An Incomplete History of St. Joseph County, Ride the Jackrabbit, and my newest is a children's book called On the Southernmost Bend. And after we're done here, you can all race over to the gift shop. They are all for sale there. And I uh, brought Sue some extras for after they sell out. Um, <laughs> Today, we are going to talk about three of South Bend's forgotten tragedies. But that seems like an awfully heavy way to start something like this. So I'm going to start with just another little story to help you get to know me, to help you understand what I do, and to kind of ease us into this thing before it gets tragedy-like. So one thing that I've been doing this year, I've been writing an article um, for a website called More and More. If you remember Bill Moore, who wrote for the Tribune, he has a website now, and I write for that website. I write an article once a week about how different streets and roads in South Bend and St. Joseph County got their names. And so it's a you know, little magazine-length article, kind of a bio of a famous guy. It's always a guy, just spoiler alert. And uh, I was working on one two weeks ago, about um, Thomas Street right out here. Thomas Street is named after a former, uh, one of the first mayors of South Bend, a guy named Alexander Napier Thomas, which is how Napier Street and Thomas Street got their names. And people ask me how I do my research, a lot of old newspapers, a couple history books I really like to go to. Um, but there's a website that the, on the, the county has a website. St. Joseph County has a website. And there's a page on their website that has information about how some of the roads got their names. And I'm going to um, just share with you that this is my favorite website on the planet. Because there's a part of this website that says many of the roads are named after famous politicians from South Bend and Indiana who served in the State House or Senate or things like that. And then it says after that, however... There is not a road named for current Vice President Charles Fairbanks. Anyone know who Charles Fairbanks is? I don't know who he is, and I've never heard of him. So I Googled him. And uh, the first thing I found out when I Googled him is that this guy died in 1909. He was from Indianapolis. He was the Vice President under Theodore Roosevelt. And apparently, the county has not updated their website since at least 1906. <laughs> so that's a little bit of what I do for fun. And if you think that's as fun as I do, then we're going to get along great. So today, I'm going to tell you the story of three tragedies. Um, and they're going to, I'm just going to warn you, they're going to get progressively worse. So we're going to laugh a little. We're going to cry a lot and we're going to learn some of the history that a lot of people don't necessarily know oh that's not the one we want to start with no way just a second here that would be a heavy one to start with you guys you'd think i would have put a bookmark in here all right here we go the year was 1935. Anyone around in 35? All right. Do you remember much of it? I was one. All right. So no. <laughs> the year was 1935, and it was probably the best time to own a newspaper in South Bend. The papers were nuts in 1935. Everything in the world was going on at the same time. 1935 was when there was wall-to-wall, day-to-day coverage of the trial of Bruno Hauptmann, charged with the kidnapping and murder of the Lindbergh baby. It had been front-page news every single day for three years. John Dillinger had just been killed, and his associates were starting to turn on him, and every single day there were more sordid details about the John Dillinger crime empire. 
Amelia Earhart was becoming the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to California. Notre Dame was at the peak of its powers. Babe Ruth was limping toward retirement. And the Chicago Cubs won 100 games, including a 21-game winning streak. But in the midst of everything that was happening across the nation on January 10th, there was one headline that was going to blow all of those quite literally off of the front page. There was a bombing downtown at the Palais Royale building. And in case you're wondering, it's the same Palais Royale building that's still there today. The story goes is that it was four in the morning. A car pulled up. A young man was spotted sprinting from the building as it exploded behind him, and he yelled, Whoo! That was a honey! Then he got into the car and vanished, never to be seen again. The only eyewitness was someone staying in a nearby hotel who was awoken by a, you know, bomb blast and rushed to the window in time to see this kid and this car dash out of sight. There were three separate bombs in the building that day. The explosion was felt as far away as Mishawaka. More than three million dollars in damages. The windows were blown out of a nearby jewelry store and every other store, but the jewelry store was the most important because the jewelry blew out of the jewelry store and scattered the streets. And morning looters came by and found free necklaces, bracelets, and rings. They know what time the explosion happened because a downtown clock, believe it's the one that is in the double tree, just stopped at 3.48 a.m. The streets were quiet, the building was quiet, and the night watchman of the Palais Royale building was off in a far end of the basement. There were no casualties from this accident, except for a handful of cats who were employed to patrol for rats. Police looked for clues, amateur detectives looked for clues, and authorities had a mess on their hands. And not because they didn't have any suspects, but because they had too many suspects. The night before the bombing at the palace, there were uh, union musicians angrily picketing outside because the Palace Cafe in the Palais Royal building hired non-union musicians. And so angry musicians marched up and down with signs hurling curses and seemed like an obvious suspect for the crime. But they weren't the only suspect because almost immediately investigators found out that the owner of the Palais Royale building had just gone through a difficult breakup with his partner. And that business partner was very upset to have been kicked out of his own business and they thought that he might be the bomber too. And then there was a third suspect. The current owner of the cafe, the one who had just booted his partner, a man named James Stasinos. James Stasinos remained in ownership of the Palace Cafe, and he was also a suspect because authorities thought it was weird that he had very recently taken out not one, but two insurance policies specifically against the bombing of his building. <laughs> Next time that you're visiting your insurance guy, ask him if you have bombing insurance. <laughs> I really just want to know what they say to that. Is that a thing? I don't know. I don't know. The police chief swore that it would be found. He said there will be no let up in our investigation and we are confident the guilty parties will be brought to justice. It is inconceivable that anyone could come into South Bend, blow up one of our buildings, and get away with it. So 
the investigation unfolded. One thing, they dismissed the union musicians almost immediately. They decided there was no way the union musicians could have been the bombers, and there was a pretty good reason for that, because the Palais Royal hired non-union musicians, uh, the Palace Cafe, I'm sorry, hired non-union musicians, but the Palais Royal building was where all the musicians played. So in order to try to blow up a building, they would endanger their moneymaker while getting back at a guy. It seems like a bad business proposition. James Stasinos, his old business par partner, had an alibi. And so they seized pretty quickly onto the Stasinos scheme, as it would come to be called. It wasn't quite the Lindbergh baby, but in South Bend, it wasn't far off. They interviewed more than 100 witnesses including those who had seen James Stasinos meeting with shady characters in Chicago. One of them swore he heard them in Chicago talking about bombs. And so it went to trial. The trial was front page news for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks as that parade of a hundred Witnesses came forward to testify, and their testimonies reported daily in the paper. But at the end, the jury must have been left with a reasonable doubt because they acquitted James Stasinos on all charges. He shook the hand of each of the jurors on his way out. Which doesn't feel like a thing that should happen, but he did. <laughs> And he gave a statement to the press that he had been vilified, but that he would rise again and build another restaurant. So he built another restaurant called the Nip and Sip. Anyone ever been to the Nip and Sip? No, you have not. Didn't make it more than a year. He had trouble getting insurance on his building. <laughs> And it's a requirement to have insurance on your building in order to get a liquor license. So since he couldn't get insurance, he couldn't get a liquor license. And since this was 1935, no one wanted to go to his restaurant. So he closed it up, defaulted on the loans he had taken out, and moved to Pensacola, Florida. There he opened up two restaurants, a place called the Romana Bar and Grill and another called the Azalea Cocktail Lounge. The Azalea Cocktail Lounge is still in business today. If you go to Pensacola, Florida, anyone have plans? You can go visit the Azalea Cocktail Lounge and enjoy a sip of South Bend history in an unexpected place. James Stasinos died in Florida in 1964 at the age of 79, and the bombing of the Palace Cafe is still considered unsolved. All right, I, oh, here's, here's an old newspaper. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but every headline on this newspaper is an absolute banger. I mean, it's just insane. We've got uh, Bruno to the ransom note, arson experts coming to South Bend, we've got Dillinger, we've got a woman who got divorced in three minutes. We have a mayor here who got in a fight. The president's talking about something. I don't even know who this guy is. Every newspaper for a year was like this. I mean, you can go back, you can go into the microfilm at the library, go straight to 1935, pick any microfilm you want, open any newspaper you want, and every story is going to be the most salacious story you've ever seen. I, uh, my daughter, she's 10, she loves to go to the library with me and look at old microfilms. It's some, just something we do together. And we love it when we find stuff like this, when we're not looking for anything in particular, and yet we just happen upon something fascinating. That's what happens a lot when you dig into history. I told you that it was gonna get more depressing as we went. Uh, chapter nine of my book, Ride the Jackrabbit, I'll just read you the chapter title. It says, The Terrible Slaughter on the Michigan Southern Railroad. So, kind of a downer. <laughs> the Terrible Slaughter on the Michigan Southern Railroad was the headline 
on page one, column one of the New York Times. At one point in time, when it happened, the train wreck that we're going to talk about right now was the deadliest railway disaster in the history of the United States. But before I can tell you about the train wreck, I have to tell you about a creek. And we've got to talk about some bridges. So to help you kind of get acclimated, we're, we're going to be talking right now about the area at Lincoln Way and Ironwood. Anyone see that in your head? Lincoln Way and Ironwood. We're going to be specifically talking about the McDonald's at Lincoln Way and Ironwood. Anyone, you know where I'm talking about? Okay, good, good. So there's train tracks that run still today behind the McDonald's at the corner of Lincoln Way and Ironwood, part of the same rail line we're going to talk about today, but not the same tracks, and we're going to find out in a minute. See, if you go south of that McDonald's, you know, it gets hilly. You know, not like Colorado or anything, but as hilly as South Bend gets is directly south of Lincoln Way there. It goes up into the hills. And so what would happen back in the day before modern sewage is that when it would rain, and sometimes it would rain a lot, all of that water would come rushing down this hill. The newspaper described it this way. It's beautiful. As usual, during a heavy rain, the water came down from the big hills south of the railroad track in a seething, boiling, foaming torrent through the bed of the creek, which at other times is but a dry, sandy waste. Yeah, so what would happen is when it was dry, the creek would, would dry hard. If you know anything about creeks that have dried hard, they don't absorb the water. They just send it. And so when they built bridges, it was called the Spring Brook Bridge over this creek, it tended to, you know, collapse. No fewer than nine bridges collapsed at this ditch during its lifetime. Think about that. At what point do you learn better? I don't know. Farmers and locals warned local governments constantly that the bridge was inadequate, that Denslow Creek was the most lethal place in the city. It would prove to be true. During rains, bandits and robbers would camp near the bridge and rob people trying to cross it because the police knew better than to follow anyone across the bridge in the rain. They knew it was unsafe. By 1884, after six attempts at less robust bridges had failed, South Bend made plans to build an unsinkable bridge. They promised engineering overkill, including 800 feet of mason-grade stonework to span a 20-foot ditch. <laughs> In September of 1884, the bridge was open to pedestrians, streetcars, and the occasional one-horse open sleigh. The city was sure this bridge would last, but they were wrong. Nearly two years to the day after it was opened, the floodgates of heaven fully opened, soaking the city in a downpour that lasted nearly four hours. Now, before I read to you what I'm going to read to you next, we have to talk a little bit about Roman mythology. Anyone real good at Roman mythology? Anyone know the storm god of Roman mythology? It's Jupiter. Okay, Jupiter is the storm god. Jupiter Pluvius is his full name. Apparently, Roman gods have last names too. So I, I'm telling you this. Jupiter Pluvius, the Roman storm god, 18... 86, there's a downpour, and the Tribune runs the following headline, which is the greatest headline I've ever read in my life. Jupiter Pluvius puked. <laughs> this is why I read old newspapers. 
Shingles were torn from houses, livestock were killed, buggies were overturned, and crops were ruined. There were hailstones the size of hen's eggs that managed to shuck corn cobs clean from their stalks. Some 15,000 panes of glass were shattered at the Oliver Chilled Plow Works, and the Spring Brook Bridge was washed away as if it were built of straws. Tragedy was barely avoided when a pair of South Benders named Chris Reeser and John Geyer ventured out into the storm to place obstructions ahead of the wreckage to warn travelers away from their attempts to cross the thing. And when I say they should have known better, this is why I say that. 25 years, a full quarter century before Jupiter Pluvius puked that year, is when all of the people died. Even after there were all of the deaths, they kept trying to build inadequate bridges again and again and again. It was June of 1859, two years before the start of the Civil War. The Studebaker Company was barely a decade old. James Oliver had just received his first patent for the chilled plow, and Schuyler Colfax was just a 35-year-old man serving a term in the Indiana State House. The population of South Bend was not yet 4,000, but the city was about to make front page news because not for the first time and not for the last time, Denslow Creek was about to flow out of control. The train between Toledo and Chicago came late at night. The railroad was weakening by the minute as a wall of water from the south pressed against it. Unfortunately for the passenger train approaching the compromised bridge, it was very heavy and it was shaking, and in an instant the embankment gave way and the bridge crumbled. Unsurprisingly, the train failed to make the jump across the ravine on its own and plunged headlong into the raging waters of the angry creek. By the time it was over, and very quickly, it was a catastrophe. The newspaper reported that the engine was literally buried in the opposite side of the ravine in quicksand and mud and the tender baggage and express car and two second-class cars were shattered almost into kindling wood and piled on top of the engine. The death count reached as high as 75, accounting for at least half of the train's capacity. And the South Bend train wreck was officially recorded as the deadliest railway disaster in the history of the United States. Nearly half of the dead were killed by drowning when they got swept in the waters down toward the river. Several were never identified. Many were not ever accounted for. Upon hearing the alarm, citizens woke up in the middle of the night and rushed to the scene to help their fellow man, but in almost all cases, there was almost nothing they can do. They reported seeing people with broken limbs, a woman buried up to her neck in quicksand, a child who had been decapitated. One woman who was with her husband and five children ran wildly about all night seeking her family, but without success until morning when she found them all dead. Then she went to a farmhouse a few yards off, where after sitting some minutes, the wretched wife and mother expired. That's the newspaper's words, not mine. If you go to the Mishawaka City Cemetery, there is a large grave that contains the bodies of those who were never identified from this train crash. Newspapers reported on it. Names of the deceased ran locally in New York, 
in Washington, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, and in Boston. Meanwhile, the railway was quickly, quickly, quickly attempting to rebuild the bridge to get the trains going again so that they could make money. It took protests, political action, and people literally barricading themselves in front of the tracks to stop developers from coming in in order to slow the rebuilding long enough at least for all of the bodies to be uncovered from the embankment. The newspapers reported that there was good news from a disaster. A safe containing more than $60,000 had been recovered along with all of the money inside of it, which feels insensitive. When Springbrook and Playland Parks, if you know those, were opened right across the street, it was at the place that was historically and statistically the most dangerous place in South Bend. Fortunately for the people running those parks, in 1906, after the failure of many bridges, dozens of deaths, and a series of crippling financial damages, they finally replaced Denslow Creek with proper sewage. The foaming and ravenous waters that used to rush down from the hills have been tamed even when the weather was not. Into the 1950s, people reported going out with metal detectors and finding chunks of train in this embankment behind that McDonald's more than a hundred years later. I know the History Museum has in its archives a part of the train's bell, but it's not on display right now that I'm aware of. The terrible slaughter on the Michigan Southern Railroad remains the deadliest disaster in the history of St. Joseph County. Now let's all take a breath. This is a picture. This is the, the picture that ran in the, um, in the New York Times. It's mind boggling. The last story that I'm going to share is the one that to me is the most personally heartbreaking. It's the story that probably made me decide I wanted to write a book. I grew up in South Bend. I graduated from LaSalle High School. Anyone? <laughs> Hello, Lions. How are you? I don't often get much of a response to that. I like this room. We did local history units every year. Um, I remember learning about lots of stuff. And somehow, no one ever told me that South Bend, St. Joseph County, used to be home to the third largest swampland in North America. No idea. I had no idea. Someone said, hey, you should watch this documentary, Everglades of the North. Have you, anyone seen the documentary, Everglades of the North? If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. I watched it, and I thought, this must be a work of fiction. Because if this was true, someone would have told me about it by now. But in fact, they hadn't. And I thought, man... If there is so much incredible stuff like this that I've never heard, someone needs to tell these stories, and it might as well be me. So if you go down to the corner of a Sample and Mayflower, you might know that intersection. There's a gas station there, a softball field, um, a butcher shop, you know, some other things. I rode my bike down there. Um, during the COVID pandemic, I went to go find the old marsh. It's tough to find. In the 1800s, they called it the Everglades of the North. It was a paradise for hunters and naturalists and for all matter of wildlife. Its lifeblood was the 250-mile Kankakee River that meandered across western Indiana and into Illinois. Incomprehensible quantities of life sprang up along its shores. Lou Wallace, the author of Ben-Hur, described it this way. When he surveyed the Kankakee Marsh for the first time, looking at it from a place not unlike the place I stood with my friends, he said, never in all my world travels have I seen a more perfect spot nor a more tantalizing river. 
Now it's a 7-Eleven. It's hard to believe that presidents of the United States, titans of industry, royals from Great Britain crossed the Atlantic Ocean. They all came to the Kankakee Marsh because it was some of the best hunting land in the world. They called it Chicago's breadbasket because it fed Chicago. It was right here. Harder to believe still is the historical fact that by the late 1800s, the people who were in charge of things decided that the Grand Kankakee Marsh simply shouldn't exist anymore. Now, I don't want to make any political statements here or anything like that, so if you are a big fan of a certain president named Millard Fillmore, <laughs> any, any big Millard Fillmore fans? Okay, good. I don't care for him. That's it. In 1850, he passed controversial legislation that opened swamplands up to anyone to do whatever they wanted to do with them. Efforts to dredge the Kankakee River began shortly thereafter. The idea was to straighten the path of the river to create more space for farmland. Evidently, some asshole looked at a map of Indiana <laughs> and decided there wasn't enough room in the state to plant corn. Steam shovels and dynamite set upon a years-long quest to destroy the river and empty the marsh. I have a quick question for you. Does anyone know what the largest inland lake in the state of Indiana is? Lake Wawasee is correct. 110 years ago, it was incorrect. 110 years ago, there was a place called Beaver Lake that was the largest inland lake in the state of Indiana, and they completely emptied it, completely destroyed it. So next time you're out by Lake Wawasee, look at that. Think about that, and then just imagine it not existing. By the time the work was done, the 250-mile Kankakee Marsh had been turned into a 90-mile drainage ditch. Five 100,000 acres of the best wetlands in North America were wiped out and the wheels were turning on what may have been the largest part of the largest extinction event in North American history. In the 1600s, the passenger pigeon was the most prolific bird throughout North America. We know the passenger pigeon. Ornithologists estimate that a single flock of passenger pigeons could number into the billions. The historical record even takes care to note the impressive amount of dung created by these flocks, comparing it to a snowfall. So next time you're complaining about a South Bend snowfall, <laughs> just remember, it could have been much worse. The passenger pigeon was extinct in 1914. In 50 years, some five billion birds were turned into zero. Does anyone want to hazard a guess at what the favorite breeding grounds of the passenger pigeon were? The Grand Kankakee Marsh. Along the way, we lost the largest black oak reservation in the world. We lost elk, countless mammals, birds, fish, trees, and flower species. It is not wrong nor is it hyperbole to suggest that the dredging of the Grand Kankakee Marsh was an ecological genocide. This is what I wrote. I need you to know, as I write this paragraph, that I am angry, and I am sad, and I am a little drunk. The bike ride through the cornfields was fine, but those cornfields never should have been there. This was supposed to be the most important and most enduring wetland in the northern half of the United States, but they murdered it. They murdered it, and it's not coming back. I want to leave you on a hopeful note, because that's uh, not it. Over the last 20 years, the Pokagon Band has made efforts and received money to restore parts of the marshland. If you um, are down south, um, south of, what's the golf course down there, whispering something? Whispering Pines, yep, if you're just north of Whispering Pines on New Road, um, you can see it and you can feel it. The, the plants are different. 
it feels a little more humid there. You are far more likely to see lots of critters running around in there. And yet, that represents one half of 1% of what the Grand Kankakee Marsh used to be. When I did this bike ride with my friends, we stopped at the new put-in to the Kankakee River at the Jasinski Boat Launch just outside of Crumbstown. And those are a bunch of words that might not mean much to you, but if you go south uh, west of here, you'll hit Crumbstown and then you'll find the Jasinski Boat Launch on the side of a cemetery. And that's where you can get into the Kankakee River now. The Kankakee River used to be flow past Mayflower and Sample and now it's been moved about five miles down the road. Um, I could have jumped across the river there. Many of you could have jumped across the river there. And to stand there, I couldn't even imagine what used to be. Um, this is a dredging machine. It's worth a Google. It's worth looking up and it's worth learning about. I've found that when we know our history, even the parts that are unpleasant, even the parts that can be a little ugly, even the parts that we're honest are not good, when we know our history, it makes the place we live a much richer place to live. That's why I started telling stories. That's why I started visiting groups like this to tell people about the place that I'm from. That's why I wrote books for adults and books for children. I was in Detroit about, um, about a month ago uh, working on another project. And when I go somewhere, I like to talk with as many people as I can find. So I talked to a, a bartender and I talked to a barista at a coffee shop and a guy at a bookstore. And I even talked with a homeless guy for a little while. And what I was struck by was that every single one of them was massively proud to be from Detroit. Massively proud to be from Detroit. Even though they were very honest and very aware that the Detroit of right now is not great. There's parts that are good and there's parts that are recovering, but not most of it. But the reason they're proud is that they know what Detroit has done, what Detroit was a part of, the good, the bad, and the ugly. My mission is to make sure we know that about here too. South Bend is an important place. It's a terrific place. It's a wonderful place. It's a fascinating place and it's got a rich, 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 rich history. Even the stuff that's not so pleasant is worth knowing. So that does it for me. I'm going to hang out for a while. Um, if you have any questions, I'll answer questions. They are selling books in the bookshop and Sue has been warned that they're going to sell out. Um, <laughs> if you buy a book over there and want me to sign it, you can come back in here. And if you have any questions, I will take some questions now. Does that sound, does that sound good, Lauren? Lauren's giving me a thumbs up. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. The studie is a beauty that is different by design. Up front, you'll find high style.